going to speak this morning. And uh, I know my dialect is hard, probably for you to understand. Maybe not as bad as his. It's pretty good close, but, uh, but it's getting close. But uh, I do thank y'all so much for letting me come this way and speak. And uh, I got somebody's. Uh, this was like a bell. This guy let me borrow it. I mean, because I. Always remember, as a minister, you always keep your watch. It don't mean anything, yeah, but you need to watch anyway. You, know? <laughs> you need to watch. But I'm really blessed to be here, and thank you so much for letting me come. Um, um, I never thought I'd be from Alabama, up in Illinois, when I started out my ministry. But here I am, and I, I'm really blessed to be a, a part of doing God's work and at God's church. And I pastor a church called Atterbury. Uh, if you don't know where that's at, you probably won't find it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You probably won't find it. It's the middle of nowhere. And uh, it's on the other side of Petersburg. And, and we have service course every Sunday. And then also we have Cowboy Church for Sunday every month. And Brother Bernie has been out there. And boy, he's been tremendous blessing to me so much. Um, I Very quickly, I wrote up here with Brother, brother, uh, brother Dan. Is it Dan? Brother Dan, mm -hmm. and I told him, I said, I prayed up before I get here, but I really didn't know how much prayer I needed. <laughs> so uh, it was amazing, but I didn't make it. But me and Dan are good friends. I love him so much, and I appreciate he's coming up. You better. <laughs> uh, me and him are good friends. Uh, we, we both got laid off at the same time at this place, and uh, and we we, we, we we was trying to make money in the way we could. So we started breaking horses for a living, me and Brother Dan. And, and we broke a few, made good money. You don't remember that? It's always in your subconscious mind. So anyway, we're breaking horses, making money. Finally, we found a horse we couldn't break. He got on it. He got through off of it. I got on it. I got through off of it. So we, and his wife and kids said, don't you get back on there. That will kill you. My mom and dad said, don't you get back on a horse. It'll kill you. We finally devised a plan and said, we'll both get on it. And we'll wear him down. So we both got on top of this horse, and I mean, it came out of the gates, and it was going, you know how they do, they go round and round and round and try to throw you in your hole, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And we just kept going and going and going, it finally slowed down, and the manager from Walmart come out and unplugged it. <laughs> <laughs> I was with you. I was with you. I thought you had <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> that remember. Anyway, thank you again for being. Hey, there's one thing about me: you'll get humor. Uh, look at me; I look kind of funny anyway. So, if you got your Bibles? Turn very quickly to Luke chapter 21. If you don't have your Bible, I will pray for you. <laughs> Do you trust me too much? Luke chapter 21 and verse 33 and 34. I don't use a lot of scripture. Uh, usually, I preach. Kind of take two verses and break them down and try to share with you what God says and use illustrations like Christ does or did. Uh, Luke chapter 21 and verse 33 and 34. This is a, if you run a parallel on this, it parallels with Matthew chapter 24. It's synopsis with it. And it's, and the scripture's not dealing so much with the, you know, the coming back of God, but it's talking about the revelation of tribulation uh, during the last days. And we see the days approaching, and I know, and I'm not here to, I'm not, I'm not into Baptists, I'm not into Methodists, I'm not here into Presbyterian, I'm not here into Catholic, I'm here for the Lord. Amen. I'm not a denominational person, so don't think I'm doing that because I don't. I preach in all of them, and I will preach in all of them, and, I, and that's just the way it is. Uh, but it's, it's talking about the end of times concerning uh, Israel and the thought pattern of man and also the gravity of the flesh. And that's where we live today, the depravity of the flesh. And so when we see the depravity of the flesh, and we see it seems like the, the, we're getting close to the last days or we're in the last days, it's easy to get discouraged. Mm -hmm. Most likely, most of you are ministers or leaders in a church. So I'm here to encourage you today, not chastise you, ridicule you, or put you down. I'm here to lift you up and help you. Because I'm there where you're at. I know what you go through because I face it every day, not just on Sunday. We all face difficulties being leaders of a church. And it's no different today than it was back then. And it's no different from back then as it is today. The disciples were having issues and this and that and other, and Christ was teaching them about things they're going to face and things they need to hold on to during 
the last days. Watch, look at verse 33 very quickly. It says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Ladies and gentlemen, we, there's only one thing you can trust in today, and that's God's Word. Amen. You can put your trust in me, and I will let you down. Amen. I will try not to let you down, but we are human. I've had one time I was supposed to preach a revival, and I got pneumonia, could not make it. Did I want to be there? Yes, but I was man. <coughs> and I let them down because I couldn't. But God's Word will stand forever. Amen. Amen. When heaven and earth is gone, Amen. heaven and earth is gone, God's word will be stained. Amen. So when the disciples were facing all these issues, Christ said, Hey, you trust my word, you'll be all right. Amen. And it's the southern dialect, you'll be okay. <laughs> and then he goes the next verse, watch this. But even though he tells them it's going to be okay, this goes, I move. So anytime you tell him, though he tells them it's going to be okay, Next verse, he gives a warning. And I'm giving you a warning here today also. Even though we trust God's Word, even though we believe in God's Word, even though we have faith in God's Word, because it, won't, it will never go away, it will always be true. Look at verse 34, what it says. It says, And take heed to yourselves, lest any time your hearts be overcharged. And then he goes on it says, With suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day comes upon you unaware. He's telling you to take heed. Because don't let your hearts be overcharged. What does it mean to be overcharged? Only time in the Bible that word's mentioned, overcharged. What does it mean? Look at the illustration. You take a battery that's six volt. <coughs> And you hook it up to a 24 volt charger. The charger's doing what it's supposed to do. But that battery can only take so much. And what will happen to that battery? She will explode. And you know why I think preachers are bowing out, bending out, and breaking down during this time of ministry in this world? Because they're being overcharged. You can let things in this world tear you down, brothers. This is a sister, but there's no sisters here. <laughs> That's fit to mess up. <laughs> you can be overcharged. And ministers, you're not above this. He's talking to disciples. Twelve men that has healed and the lame. Made them walk. Made the blind see. One of them walked on water for a little while. He's telling them, hey, better watch it. You can be overcharged. And ministers, great men in here, you've got some great men. If you're not careful, you also can and will be overcharged. <coughs> Dealing with things you can't, you don't know what to deal with. And he goes on to tell you very quickly, he says, Look at verse 34. He said, take heed. If brothers, here's what you need to preach on Sunday. I'm helping you out. This is a, something you can help with Sunday. 34, take heed to yourselves, lest any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering team. You look that word in context, that means having headaches. That means, what do you call it? Stress. We live in a fast-paced society. How many believe it? If you don't believe it, when you stop the red light, Stay there a little while and see what happens. <laughs> when I was coming from Alabama to Illinois, I was going, brother, I was going 90 miles per hour. I was breaking the law, heaven forbid. <laughs> and this woman passed me and I looked over and I said, what in the world? And I guarantee she was 90 years old. <laughs> had a tattoo on her arm, had a cigar sticking out of her mouth, and she waved in a not kind way to get out of her way. She told me I was number one. <laughs> so, but, 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 but what I'm saying is, we as people in society we live in, we get overcharged with pressure, stress. How many of you go to church and you feel pressure sometimes? Amen. Preachers, we feel stress. And Jesus is telling the disciples, listen, suffering will overcharge you. 
And it will me too. And it will you. Number two, very quickly, I've got this watch and I can't even hardly read it, but we'll read it. <laughs> And it says in drunkenness. Now we're going to say, you know, we're, oh, we're going to talk about booze. No, we're not. <laughs> we're going to talk about anything that comes between you and God, you can be drunken with. That's what that verse means. Anything that controls you and takes the place of God, you're considered drunken by. That's what that verse means. It can be anything. It could be golfing. It could be fishing. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that, but you can't be drunk and can't control your life. Then he also says very quickly, in cares of life. There's your outline for Sunday. Y'all can send me your check in the mail. <laughs> and your cares of this life. Let's talk about pleasure. You know, I think we all need some time away. We all need, some, whether it's fishing, golfing, hunting, this and that and other. We all need time away. You know, the Bible, nowhere does it say that, that, that Christ condemned a man for having some kind of recreation activity. As long as it takes the place of God. Amen. Amen. Um, I like that. And Paul even, uh, it says here, um, tells us, he and Jesus told disciples to go out to the desert and rest. You need to fish sometimes. Bro. I see some of this. Hey, you can have a good time. But you can't let that override your relationship with the Lord. So Jesus is saying, this is Jesus' word. This is not my word. He says, don't be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life. We have to be careful, people. Why do you think pastors are bailing out? Because they're overcharged. I'm trying to find something to help us today. You know, today that the, in depression medicine, did you know that the last year that there's been more depression medicine sold than the last 10 years together? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Overcharged. You can't get overcharged. And why does Satan overcharge us? Because the Bible says our strength is the joy of the who? The Lord. Lord. And when you're overcharged, you lose your strength. Because you can't praise God when you're overcharged. We can't glorify the Master when you're overcome with problems and situations and trials and tribulation. You can't do it because you are overcharged. And if you keep on, just like the little battery, you will blow and you will bend and you will bow and you will eventually break. Ministers, we don't need to be overcharged. But very quickly, I'm going to give you some uh, ways uh, and reasons and rhymes how we can get overcharged. And I'm going to give them very quickly. So don't let the weight of troubles and trials overcharge you. The Bible says that the Lord knows our frame. That's mentioned in the Bible, right? right. It's like this. I don't know what's behind this wall. Odds are, I don't know, it's probably maybe two by fours or two by sixes. I would say. Don't know though, Bernie. I don't know what's behind there. But God does. Mm -hmm. And you don't know your frame either. But God does. You've heard the statement, I, He'll put no more on you than you can bear. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you something, you can put more on you than you can bear yourself. We need to make sure we know that God knows our frame. He knows what's behind this wall here. I don't know. I don't know how much I can take, but the Lord knows how much we can take. So we have to trust Him in that situation. You said, tell me a story. Remember when Jacob and Esau, when they had the big family reunion, and, and Jacob came up to Esau, and it was a good time then. Esau was wanting to kill him, but he let it slide. <laughs> I couldn't have done that probably, but he did. And he said, and here, but you lose a point in that whole scripture. Esau comes to Jacob, he puts his arm around him. He said, Jacob said, oh, my mature herdsman will take you, your sheep, and we'll, we'll drive them where they need to go. Jacob said, no, they won't. He said, you have a mature herdsman, and you have mature sheep. He says, I have young sheep. 
immature sheep. And your mature herdsman will run my, dry my sheep too hard and too fast and will kill them. Ain't it great that we got a shepherd who knows how much mm -hmm. he can drive us? Amen. It's good to know that how much he can drive us. Because he does drive us sometimes. We can't let the, 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 the troubles and trials and tribulation overcharge us. Don't let expected events overcharge you. Have you ever, since you've been pastoring here and been preaching, how many times have you ever seen something happen you've never seen happen before in your life? Yeah. Give you a story. In Alabama, we... I'm going to move around because I bet you got me. <coughs> I mean, in, in Alabama, we have... We, you know, most people have our, the baptisms behind the pew, right? But in Alabama, they have them in front sometimes. And so I... You know, I'm preaching and I move. And I walk around and I preach the Bible. It's a huge church. I mean, it's about as far is that a tennis court? A tennis court. I mean, all the way out there. Yeah. yeah. And it's you know, everybody knows that the church is always downhill to the to the altar. There's a reason behind that. Because if you fall on the way up, you're going to make it to the altar. That's why. It's there. <laughs> so anyway, I stepped out, and I remember this 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 baptism here, and I put my foot on it, and I felt it give. I said that could be dangerous. You know, I'm preaching. So anyway, I was preaching and preaching, moving back and forth. Finally, I called the altar call. And when I called the altar call, at the very end of the church, here comes this woman out of the pew. And she is bountifully blessed all over. <laughs> She's a big woman. I'm talking about big. <laughs> you remember when that earthquake happened over there? That was her moving at that time. But she's coming this way. And I look at her and she's running and crying and weeping. And I've and I looked at the pastor. He's over there. I said, and I looked at her and I looked at him. He's like, I look back here and I'm like, <clears throat> and, he's, and, and she just keeps coming. <laughs> and she's running as fast as she could go. And I knew she didn't have enough brakes to stop all that. I knew that. I knew she didn't. Well, I didn't like any red blood American did, boy, man, or whatever. Right when she got to me, I moved the side. <laughs> she hit the side of that board. It stood straight up. She went down in the baptism. And that's the only woman I've ever seen got baptized and saved the same time. <laughs> so, so, that happened. And, that, and, that, and here's my thing of that is this. That was unexpected, right? If I'd seen that coming, I'd never step from that pew, brother. I wouldn't have I'd never step around that. I wouldn't ever. But you know, there's other unexpected things happen that we have no you know, control over. And if we look at them long enough, they will overcharge us. You don't expect losing a loved one or a wife or a husband. Family member, nothing like that. And if we dwell on that, unexpected events, they will overcharge us. That's number two. Number three, very quickly. We've got to take life and its issues one day at a time. You know, every morning you get up, there's no decision you'll make that day. No decision. But when you get up, you got maybe you got eight things going right. But you got one that ain't right. It's just tearing you up. What how many what do you think Satan's gonna focus your mind on? The eight good things? Or the one bad one? Does he ever do that? He does that to me. So what I do, I leave the house should be praising God, rejoicing because God give me a good thing, but what I do to leave the house going, man, I just keep standing up one issue. And we focus on that one issue. And we dwell on that one issue. And we live with that one issue. And then we come back at home at night and we sleep with that one issue. And we try to work with that issue. And what happens? Our joy and our shouting and our praising God is gone because of that one issue. When we should be praising God of the eight. Right? Amen. And when we do that, ladies and gentlemen, what happens? We get overcharged. Because what do you do? You focus on that and you can't find a joy in the Lord anymore. Being overcharged. Minister, I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to anybody else. I'm talking to you. That's number number three. 
Now then, number four. Never let your past mistakes overcharge you. Now, I'm going to bust somebody's bubble here very quickly. If you think you're perfect, you got another thing coming. I'm talking a bunch of ministers. You ain't perfect. I'm not perfect. When I get to glory, brothers and sisters, I'll be perfect, right? Amen. Amen. But we've had past mistakes, past failures, past situations. And all of this is happening. Now, I, I'm, I, I'm like, I give illustration through my points. I was preaching. How many Methodist people we have here today? Oh, you are too. I'm just going to go ahead and apologize to y'all before I even get started. Okay? <laughs> I'm just going to apologize to you before I even say nothing. <laughs> I was preaching another revival. Well, it wasn't really a revival. It was just asked me to come and visit and preach. And when I come in, I don't know if they do it up here, they make you wear robes down there. Now, Baptists, I don't wear robes. <laughs> so they, bro, they put, I walked in and Steve said, you got to put a robe on. I said, I ain't never wore a robe in my life. I've been preaching, I put this for my fourth message. <laughs> So I've got a robe on. <laughs> You're a Memphis too, right? Thank God. I got two guys to fight on the way out. I'm good. But anyway, put a robe on me. So here I am, like fourth mission. I'm like you. I can't move my legs. So I'm preaching like a Baptist does, and that's what I am. And I get one of them good. I ripped the whole back of the back. <laughs> gone. Gone. So here I walk behind the pew and I was like, oh man, you know, the fourth message. <laughs> so I'm swinging around the pulpit like I always do and preaching, and there was a cup of water there. I reached down and I just went, I just chugged it down. It was a gold god, god liver in silver color. <laughs> and there's two ladies on the front one went, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh. And, and I heard of him, he drunk our baptistry. <laughs> I'm sorry, bro. Wrong place, wrong time. You know what? They asked me to come back next week because they didn't know what was going to happen. I come back next week and said, we want you to stay over here. I said, you don't know much about our treaties, but. Hey, something gonna happen. <laughs> but you know, sometimes that was a mistake of mine. It was bad. And Steve, when I went outside, he said, "You know, you're drunk or bad." I said, "I am so sorry." <laughs> I said, "But that's what happened." <laughs> Fourth time I preached. You can go to church and do that but anyway. But you know, when you mess up in the past, and you know, Satan tried to use that. I can't believe you did that. Satan tried to say, "I can't believe you did that." Finally, I said, you know what? There ain't nobody perfect. And I'm not going to be perfect until I get to glory. Amen. And you're not going to be perfect until you get to glory. Amen. Last but not least, never let what people say about you, ministers, <laughs> overcharge you. Amen. You're not going to make everybody happy Amen. and turn up for the day. Amen. Amen. <laughs> If you think you are, you're in the wrong business because you're not going to make people happy all the time. That's life. I've done chaplain work for a hospice. Did that for years. And they sent me out to a lady and they said, I'm going to warn you, she's an atheist. If you're an atheist today, you're in the wrong place because you don't get the gospel. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and, uh, I walked in, but when I walked in that room where she's at, she said, oh, she gave Brother Burns, she looked at me, she just looked at me, I mean, she said, are you a minister? I said, yes, ma'am, I am. She said, well, I want you to know, don't, don't, don't you pray for me, and don't you even go home and pray for me. And she called me some names along with that. I've never been cussed before like that. So it was hard for me to understand. She's a little bitty woman. And I was worried about that. I really did. I went back to all. I said, I ain't going back out there. You go out there and get cut. See how you like it. 
She said, well, she is about five foot two. I said, her mouth is five foot eight. <laughs> <laughs> She cussed me out, and, 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 and but said, her, her daughter-in-law said, please keep going after her. I'm begging. She got on and she put I said, I'll go after her again. Went after her again, though. The same thing. I said, don't, what did I say? Never let what people say about you overcharge you. If you're a minister, you're going to have something said about you. If you're not, if you're, not you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. That's right, man. Come on. So, anyway, I went back at her, and she cut, done it again. Finally, she got put in a nursing home. And I said, I definitely ain't going because I don't want really anybody to see her do that to me. But guess what? She said, please just go out there. Please, I'm begging you. I said, all right, I'll go out there. And Bernie, I got out in the parking lot and I put my head on the, on the steering wheel and I prayed. I said, Lord, please help me. I walked in and Lord told me to do this. Not maybe an audible voice, but I had this, this I don't know, this thought process. Here's what I'm going to do. I walked in and said, when you go into a nursing home, there's people everywhere. There's women everywhere. And they're you know, older women. And they love young men going in there. So I walked in there. And brother, I hugged every one of them except her. They were in a big room. I walked in and hugged her, 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 her. And I skipped her. <laughs> I moved to the next thing. I did that today. And the next day I did the same thing. I know she kept watching. Then the next day I did the same thing. Finally the next day she went. I said, I'm winning. Next day, she reached up and kind of grabbed me by the leg. I patted her on the head. Then the next day, she had a, a stroke and she had a breakdown. And she said, I want to see that young preacher. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I went out there. This, uh, I can't remember the <clears throat> nurse's name. Oh, hey, I can see her, but I can't remember. <clears throat> anyway, I rode out there. And there she was. Big blue eyes. She didn't cuss me this time. She said, I want to know. I want to know how to be saved. Amen. 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 I got on my knees in, that, in, the, in, in, in there in that room. And the, the nurse said, what's he doing? He said, he's a preacher. What's he doing on his knees? <laughs> <laughs> I held her hand. And I asked her in a letter to the Lord, and I asked her, I said, Sweetie, if you were standing at the gates of heaven, what reason would you tell Jesus that would let you in? And she said, I'll tell him this, that I choose him as my personal Savior. Amen. Amen. He baptized her. A few days later, she died. Amen. I stood behind the pulpit at her funeral, and I said this. If we listen to what people tell us, we can't minister. Because we can't listen to them. We got to listen to Him. Amen. That's right. And when we listen to Him, we can do great and wonderful works. If and only if we don't get overcharged. <laughs> I love you so much. Appreciate you. I want you to know. Ministers, tomorrow or Sunday when you go to church, you hang in there. Because Satan's trying to steal your joy, steal your happiness, and steal your praise. And how does he do that? By overcharging. <clears throat> Take this and run with it. Because it's God's Word. Amen. Let's go Lord in prayer. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your mercy and your grace and long suffering. Lord, we thank you for an opportunity to be here today. And Lord, we love these precious people and we care for them. And Lord, they're all ministers or leaders or elders in the church, or they just want to learn something new from the Bible. Lord, we beg and pray, dear Heavenly Father, we broke down this scripture from Luke. Lord, that they don't get overcharged. They don't quit. They don't give in. They don't throw in the towel. They hang on to the truths of God's Word. He said He'll never leave us or forsake us. And when the pressure of this world comes crashing down upon us, all we got to do is lift our hands up and He'll reach down and give us what we need at the time and then also that hour and also a minute or that second. Lord, pray to you, Father, today that there's no one here being overcharged, but I would say, for the surety of God's Word,
There's probably someone out here facing issues in their ministry, in their family, in their job, whatever it is, dear Heavenly Father, they're facing, and it's overcharging them. Lord, I pray today, dear Heavenly Father, this message will help them face everyday life. Lord, I pray, dear Heavenly Father, we go home. Lord, I pray that we can say, it's been great, it's been grand to be in this meeting today. And Lord, I pray when we leave, we'll leave with a smile and a trust and peace in our heart, knowing you are in control. And we trust you give us strength during this time. Lord, have your way in this meeting today. Thank the ones, Lord, that, that, that's over it. I pray that you give us strength to continue to do this. All the things I your holy name. Amen. 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 God bless you.